So I'm going to welcome on stage the stars and writer and director of the movie, Dane DeHaan, <laughs> Aubrey Plaza, and Jeff Bena. Thanks, everybody, for being here. You're welcome. <laughs> so I already got you. <laughs> um, Jeff, maybe I'll start with you, since this is your uh, movie that you wrote and directed. What gave you the idea to, to have a rom-com about the undead? Yeah, I wrote this in 2003, and I don't know what I was going through. Um, I mean, I'm sure I'd been through breakups, and I was reading... But, if you guys know Jacques Derrida, he has a whole thing where he was going off on zombies, and that was definitely influential, but I don't really know that what my headspace is. That is not space. true. Yeah, it is. <laughs> it's actually true. Do you guys know true. about the Derrida uh, zombie sequence? <laughs> well, there's no... Yeah, there's he's, no a, he's a French philosopher. He's a French philosopher, yeah. Yeah, no, he has, he has... I mean, do you want me to talk about this? This is, like, not the most fun thing to talk about. It's just it's true. It's definitely true. Trust me. Yeah. All right, go ahead. Yeah. <laughs> okay. All right, so Jacques Derrida has a whole, one of the things he kind of got caught up on is language isn't perfect because, you know, even things that we consider opposites, like up and down, black and white, they all are relative to each other. They inform, like you can't have white without black. You can't have light without darkness. They're, they're, they're not these perfect, absolute concepts. And so he actually suggested zombies are kind of reminiscent of the way language works in that zombies are neither dead nor alive. They're undead. So they're, they're sort of in between straddling this, these two polar opposites that are sort of paradoxical. And, you know, he was suggesting basically language is a, a virus too. So he, he definitely was talking about zombies. There was, he, he, he studied zombie films and... Uh, thank you, off. thank you for schooling yeah. me. This is the most high-minded talk about uh, zombie rom-coms that I ever expected to have. Yeah. I appreciate it. You're welcome. So, but you were reading a lot of Derrida, that's how we all get over breakups. Yeah, and I mean, I, honestly, there wasn't like anything that was like, oh, I have to make a zombie movie. There, I just, there was a scene in my head about when he sees her after she's supposed to have been dead and he's shut out by her, by her parents after being so close, this sort of weird, confusing moment where he sees her inside and she's alive. And I sort of built the movie out of that and just trying to maintain that hesitation of knowing exactly what's going on. Was it hard to find the right tone uh, for comedy for something like this? Um, no, I mean, I just wrote parts that I thought were funny and parts that I thought were kind of real in the moment. And it, in the, as long as we were sort of tracking Zach and what he was feeling, I felt like you, you can kind of get away with some more absurdity and some more groundedness at the same time. Um, the the um, style of the movie, though, did you always think this is going to be like a present day movie? You, you, got, you kind of wrote it before there was this big zombie um, resurgence, right? Yeah, I wrote it in 2003, and uh, we were about to make it in 2003, and it fell through, but uh, yeah, it wasn't, uh, I guess it was before the zombie, I guess Shaun of the Dead came out in 2004, I don't know. So that was, you know, that, that was when they started doing zombie comedies, so I guess it became a thing. But when I wrote it at first, there was really, it wasn't a thing, and I just liked that story. I thought it was fun. Um, and Aubrey, you came on to it, how? I um, heard about it uh, a lot. I heard about the script, and a lot of people that know Jeff and know his writing, he's written a, a lot of scripts, probably like over 20 scripts, right? And a little less than that, yeah. Uh, okay. And um, I just, it was like um, this thing that I always heard about, and I finally read it, and I thought it was so good. And um, I just was trying to figure out what I wanted to do uh, and it just seemed kind of like it was destined to happen. It just felt perfect. Because you'd always wanted to play the undead? Um, I actually never thought about that before. I never, um, zombies are definitely cool and I'll watch a zombie movie anytime, but they weren't something that I was, you know, it wasn't something I was trying to do. But um, there was just something about this script and the character that I connected to and I felt like I could do, or I felt like it was a fun challenge to play a, a dead person that turns into a monster. Dan, you're kind of the straight man in the movie. You've got the most traditional kind of part. Yes, I do. <laughs> Did you think about it that way? Uh, yeah, I mean, I thought of it as um, 
an opportunity to make my first comedic film and to do it with some of my favorite comedians. And I just thought that would be a really cool experience. And, um, you know, I think I had visions in my mind of um, being just as funny as them. But um, w then when we got on set and I started like trying to be funny, it was very obviously not working. Um, so it became obvious very shortly thereafter that my role in the film was to honor the truth of it and to react to the um, heightened, extreme, hilarious circumstances. Get that dog out of here! <laughs> Excuse me, miss? <laughs> Sorry. If a dog comes near me, I'm gonna freak out. <laughs> that were going on around me. Did any of you guys watch any zombie movies to prepare? I mean, I've seen pretty much most of them. So I, I, wasn't, I wasn't specifically aiming to do a zombie movie when I wrote it. It was more just a relationship movie. But when the zombie elements obviously start appearing, I think, if anything, I tried to avoid some of the cliches that you see in zombie movies. So, I mean, the, in terms of Night of the Living Dead, that was obviously an influence because they're dead and they come back to life. And Dawn of the Dead was an influence because you start seeing Ascension zombie. But other than that, it was a very specific story, uh, subjective, told from the point of view of one single person who had nothing to do with the macro grand scheme of things, but was thrust into his own personal story. And I try to sort of peripheralize all the major zombie elements and tropes that you're used to and sort of focus on the emotional trajectory of it. So there you go. Are we good on the dog front? Good? I don't know. Are we? <laughs> Miss? <laughs> what about you guys? Did you, were you familiar with this canon of film or did you also try and stay away from it and think about, I'm thinking about this as a love story or as like a, a, a teen romance? Uh, yeah, I think that's more how I thought of it. You know, I didn't really watch any zombie films to in, specifically to prepare for this. And I think one of the things that's so unique about it is, you know, most zombie films are about the zombie apocalypse itself. But this takes a very small microcosm of, um, you know, what goes behind, what goes on just in one house with one person that has a relationship with one zombie, and that's what was so unique about it to me is that it was so much about the relationships and that kind of thing and not really um, a traditional zombie film at all. I uh, did not watch a lot of zombie movies. I saw, I think World War Z was like, is like the last zombie movie I saw and that was an accident. So um, I tried to erase all memories of zombie anything from my mind because um, originally, when I uh, was thinking about how am I going to do this, um, I thought I should watch every zombie movie and like totally binge on zombie craziness to get into the mindset. And then I felt like uh, maybe that would actually n not be good because every other zombie movie is just someone's version of what a zombie is because zombies aren't real and they're just what we want them to be. So I just kind of went off the script and let whatever was in Jeff's imagination kind of inform me and my choices, and then I just let my imagination go wild. Well, do you want to talk about what, what that was like when your imagination went wild? Yeah, what was that like? Yeah. <laughs> Tell us more uh, about that, Aubrey. No, I didn't want to talk about that. Um, uh, uh, when my imagination goes wild, I... Um, <laughs> Uh, I don't know. I just, well, I, I honestly, I felt like there's been many times in my life that I've been drawn to demonic forces, <laughs> um, you know, monsters, witches, hags, specifically, um, things of that nature. And so this was kind of the first time that I felt like, oh, now here's a role I can really just sink my teeth into. Oh, you went there. You went um, that line. I did go there, and it was really fun to do something physical like that. And I felt like I had a lot of, like, you know, demon voices and things like that in my back pocket just ready to go. Well, let's watch a clip of uh, an, early, an early moment in the movie, fairly early. That was the uh, G-rated version. Yeah. 
Um, so the conceit here is that is the uh, Aubrey your character doesn't really know what happens what happened to her at the beginning. Yeah. Um, in the beginning, I show up and there's something kind of off about me, but uh, no one really knows what what it is, and I don't either. I'm not like self aware that I'm a zombie at all. So um, can you guys talk about playing to that tension? Like the audience knows, right, that you're a zombie at this point. The audience is kind of with Dane's character. We know what's going on. Um, and Jeff, maybe you can talk about how you structured it to make sure that, you know, Aubrey's character is in the closet, literally, about what's going on, and the rest of us kind of are in on it. Yeah, I mean, obviously, it's a really awkward situation, and everyone's kind of coming at it from a different place. You know, Zach's coming from, or Dane's character is coming from more of like a cognitive dissonance place where he can't reconcile that she's both dead and alive. He thought she's dead. Now she finds out she's alive. That's the best thing in the world. But how's that possible? He's like going through a whole spiral, downward spiral of thoughts. And her parents are just so jazzed that she's back that they're not even like getting into the questions of it. They're just, it's imagine your daughter died. And then the one thing you want obviously is something irrational. And then when that irrational thing happens, that's like, why look into it? And so, and she has no idea what's going on. She's like totally just didn't skip a beat. So the, the, that kind of cluster mess of you know people's different motivations and understanding it's just i don't know i think it's fun and like chaotic so do you guys find it fun yeah well what i think what's really great and fun about it is that um in a strange way it all really makes a lot of sense you know what everybody's perspective is very clear and uh, a very lo logical way of thinking if something like this were to actually happen you know you're not um you're not automatically afraid of her. You're not, it, you're not like, you know, you don't think it's the zombie apocalypse. It's really, it's a personal relationship and it's navigating your feelings and your personal relationship that you have with these people and watching that takes place. And that's what I think is so fun about it. Do you guys think of the, a, a lot of the reason that people think that zombies have had such a cultural resurgence is because they're an easy metaphor, right? You can see a lot of things in them, you know. Did you think of it that way or were you just thinking about it as like, this one character comes back to life. Anybody, jump in. Yeah, I mean, I think zombies are a great metaphor. I mean, they, you can apply it to a lot of things. And, you know, this in particular, someone seeming to be themselves but being slightly different, that's like what a zombie is. They're, they're like almost the scariest monster, not because they're so powerful, but because they're like us and they're so similar to us. And so I think I just try to stretch out that idea of, a relationship with somebody who slowly becoming someone that you don't recognize anymore. That's depressing. <laughs> I um, didn't really think about it like, I, like uh, as a zombie metaphor personally, just because I was coming at it from like the other way around, I guess. I was like kind of grasping onto all of the human qualities that I wanted her to have. It's easier for me to play a zombie than a human. Um, so I, I was kind of like working in that area more and then funneling that through a zombie's eyes. A zombie's eyes. I know you were really, you were really excited. You were really excited about the zombie makeup. Yeah, I was. I've never gotten to do prosthetics or anything um, like Mr. DeHaan has. Um, and he, yes, I was very excited. That was fun. I liked it. Did you, did you think like more gore, not enough gore? Either of you, any of you guys? Um, oh, in the movie, I don't really love gore that much. So I was cool with the amount of gore. I actually do like gore in movies, but for this movie, I try to kind of keep it to a min not a minimum, but just the, you know, the, the amount you'd probably see if this were to happen as opposed to, you know, gratuitous amount of just but I do, I like, you know, I like giallos. I like people just getting ripped open. So that's fun for me, but it wasn't appropriate for this one. But for your makeup, did you think, uh, I want to look more pale and creepy? Um, I think they did a pretty good job. Like, I had, we had five stages of zombiness. So um, I thought it was kind of cool the way they mapped it out. And, um, and it helped me just with my performance to know like, okay, at this point in the movie, I'm a stage three zombie. So it's like, I connected the physical stuff to like what was going on mentally. Um, and I think like stage five zombie for me was like, I had blood all over me and like 
uh, dirt and you know like it was pretty like messed she up. She was like totally decomposed. I mean, the, yeah, the girl so, who did the the makeup is from Parks and Rec, Anna Butler, and she's awesome. Yeah. And she's so good, and she she and I walked looked at a lot of messed up po- photos of dead people, and we just try to match realistic decomposition. So. Yeah. I, but I but to answer your question, I was not like, give it to me more. I was like, that's this is the right amount. Dane, were you ever jealous? Did you ever want to just sample that makeup? Um, I was not jealous at all um, because I I feel like I'm the guy they always put in prosthetics. I'm like that guy. I've done almost every movie I've done, I'm in the prosthetic chair for a really long time, and I had just gotten done um, doing Spider-Man, which was pretty much the most intense prosthetics that I had done. Um, We started filming this movie two weeks later, so I was so happy to have the later call time to set and show up and see Aubrey in that chair. Yeah, he was really happy. He made that very clear. Yeah. Every morning. He'd be like, what time did you get here? What time did you get here? I go oh, yeah, cool. five I was, hours ago. Oh, yeah, I just got here. That's crazy. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, but actors often talk about how getting the makeup on when you see yourself uh, for the first time in the mirror is a way into the character, and it sounds like that was the case for you, Aubrey. Yeah, I think physical, physical um, stuff for me is very helpful. Um, not everyone is like that, I'm sure, but for me it's... I love I love it because I grew up like lo- loving costumes and uniforms and I connect with uh, physical difference differences changes words. <laughs> was this an easy movie to get made post the zombie resurgence? Uh, yeah, it was easier than in 2003. So, um, but it was also like, I, I tried to do it in 2003. It almost happened and it fell through. And then I walked away from it for 10 years. And so the way it kind of came together was instantaneous. You know, Aubrey and her agent had you a meeting. You could say it was dead and it came back to life. <laughs> you could say that. Yeah. Yeah. And then once we, once we got the ball rolling you know once Aubrey and John C. Riley came on board and Dane it was it was pretty fast like it snowballed really fast it, it, went, it went from like hibernating for 10 years or being dead for 10 years to just automatically you know sort of rocketing fast through the you're trying really hard to pummeling avoid. through the earth from its grave Guys, I want you to get this image of something moving really fast and then imagine that thing is this movie happening just really fast Everyone close your eyes. Um, uh, maybe we'll watch one more clip. Um, Let's do it. I think this is from later in the movie when Aubrey, maybe you're just, your character is just beginning to realize what's, what's happening to her. So is smooth jazz just inherently funny? Yeah, I mean, Smooth Jazz, I, I'm not a big fan of it, so if I hear it, I can't take it seriously, but um, I think it's pretty funny. I, I had read an article years before about how Smooth Jazz is really good for your immune system and how on some unconscious level it, it just relaxes you and just, it, that's why they play in doctor's offices and hospitals, and so the line of thinking was that if, you know, that music is good for you on the most basic human level and zombies are operating on that level, that that would be a music they would appreciate. How do you guys feel about smooth jazz? I love it. I can't get enough of it. <laughs> and I grew up playing the saxophone, so every time I hear a saxophone, I think of my childhood. And um, <laughs> Dane, I know you're more of a rap guy. Started from the bottom, now we're here. Oh, no. <laughs> oh, no. He can keep going. He knows all the words. No, that's about all I know. I've been learning it today. I love that song. (laughs) All right, we have time for some audience Q&A. There's going to be some folks with mics, and they'll come up to you, and uh, maybe by the end of it, you'll get Dane to rap the whole whole trade song. Started from the bottom, now the whole team here. Hi, Aubrey, I think you're awesome, and I have been getting excited the more female comedians I see writing books these days, and so I was just wondering if you would consider doing that or not. Sorry, if I considered... 
writing a book. Uh, I've considered writing a book, um, but only because someone once I was someone a public book place once asked me if I wanted to write a book, and I was going to, and then I just didn't do it. Um, <laughs> because I felt like I don't have anything to say at this point, but um, I don't know, maybe, I don't know. I'm not against it. Um, hi, Dane. Uh, I was wondering what made you take up this role, because we're so used to seeing you playing introverted and more somber characters, like in Chronicles and, and um, um, Kill Your Darling, which I love, and you did an excellent, you know, you're great. Oh, thanks. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, well, I'm always looking for uh, different things to do, you know? Um, I don't think Lucian Carr was introverted at all. He was a fairly extroverted person. But um, this is definitely my first um, comedic film, and that's why I wanted to do it. I was just get, uh, coming off doing Spider-Man, which was really intense, and I was looking for something different uh, to be doing, and there was really nothing more different than um, a super low-budget Zomcom rom -drom. So in that, in that uh, sense, it seemed like a logical choice. And I was going to get to do my first comedy with some of my favorite comedians. And um, I knew I would learn a lot from them. Um, and that's pretty much why I did it. Could you speak about acting with the refrigerator? I'd like to hear a little bit more about how it was to you know, express yourself with a refrigerator attached to your back. Yes, sir, I can. Um, it, was a, it was a stove. It was a, it was a stove. It was a stove. stove excuse me. Stove. I qualify. Appli Quite the kitchen opposite. Kitchen appliances. Uh, they're all the same. Um, it was really fun um, to have an oven strapped to my back. And it was even more... F Am I allowed to say? Yeah. Ugh. Sorry, I don't want to give any spoilers. The first time I put the oven on my back, I uh, ripped my abdominal wall. I tore my abdominal muscles, and um, that was kind of messed up because I thought an organ had burst. But um, that was, it, you know, it's just that's what happens sometimes. The show must go on. The show must go on, and I started in vaudeville, so I know that. And um, it was fun. It was fun. It was hard. It was really heavy. But whoa, what? Okay. Uh, what was your scariest movie you saw because this is horror movie? Me, Sh The Shining. It ch 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 gives me the cheese over. Then I love The Descent. Then uh, I think Ted was scary because t talking teddy bear. <laughs> yeah, so I want to know which one... Okay, okay you know, wait, wait a minute. Yeah, what's Ted, your name? Uh, Yoshi, I'm Yoshi. I'm Japanese, you know. Yoshi? Yoshi, thank you. Oh, okay. After the show, maybe hug. Yeah, yeah, we need yeah. to talk well, later. So <laughs> yeah, yeah, me, so me, thank you. So me, me later. The scariest movie ever, so okay. Thank you. Okay. The question is, what's the scariest movie you ever saw? Well, maybe It. Yeah. 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 Um, I don't know why. I'm sure this, I, there's so many, I get scared by movies easily, but um, I, I remember being alone and watching like part of The Hills Have Eyes or something, and oh, I, I was so <laughs> scared that I was just really scared. Yeah, I, the scariest moment, which is not, it's embarrassing, but in, do you guys know the movie Pet Cemetery when the sister is like in the bed with meningitis screaming out, like, ah, dot, whatever? <laughs> that scared me more than anything ever, for, for, but I don't know why, but I think the scariest movie is either like The, Sh the Shining, like you said. I mean, that, it's the creepiest, scariest, and I like, don't look now a lot too. That's got a lot of creepy moments that I like a lot. Cape, Cape Fear kind of scared the shit out of me too. Um, another question, Aubrey. Um, what made you take this role in this movie? Like, what, what, what like, uh, gave you the incentive to take this role in this movie? Um, I just really liked the script. I read the script and I thought it was great and really funny. And I really believed in Jeff as a director. I felt like he was going to kill it and um, I don't know I just really connected to the I thought it was cool because uh, I think it's a kind of a hard movie to pull off and it's a, there's a very delicate balance between having it be really real and relatable and then have having supernatural th things happen so um, I just thought it was a really well done script so who, which would be the apex predator a zombie or like Jurassic Park's velociraptors velociraptors <laughs> Why? I, zombies wouldn't be as fast and wouldn't, 
I mean, they, I mean, their velociraptors actually were not big. They were like this big, and zombies probably would have a hard time bending over. And, and vol don't velociraptors strategize with each other? Yeah, they work together. Yeah. They hunt their prey. They have that's feathers. That's always evil. I, yeah, definitely. I mean, that's like no question. I think. Yeah. Um, this question is for all three of you. As a director and writer, what was the challenges in just bringing this to life? And as the actors of this, what was the hardest thing to do in adapting to as the zombie and boyfriend to the zombie? I'd say the biggest ch to adapting or when you're making it, like the production problems or just actually getting it made? Actually, actually getting it made? Um, yeah, money. I mean, you need to get money and people don't just fork money over, especially if you're a first time director. So uh, the challenge is to, I guess, organize people to get behind it and then get money to make it. Um, I think the biggest challenge for me with playing the character was just um, keeping track of the balance of when, of how much of a zombie I am at, at, at any given moment in the movie. Like, I just always was having to kind of ride the line and make choices about w when I am going to feel human emotions and when I'm going to switch into zombie mode. So that was a challenge, but it was a fun challenge. Um, yeah, well, this was, it's my first comedic movie and kind of the, like, school of acting that I come from. It's like you kind of just do what you feel at all times, you know, and if you, like, feel like crying, then you cry, and if you feel like laughing, then you laugh. But all of a sudden, I was thrown into the situation where I wanted to laugh all the time, but I wasn't allowed to. Um, so, honestly, that was one of the biggest challenges, was just keeping a straight face in front of, like, John C. Riley, who's being really hilarious <laughs> right in front of me. Dogs don't need computers, sir. <laughs> they don't know how to work computers. Hi, um, Aubrey, um, whenever I'm sad, I watch your uh, Portlandia episode of Feminist Bookstore. Sorry, I'm right here. Oh. I, I saw you looking that way, and I was like, oh, my God. No, I watched your feminist bookstore episode, <laughs> and, it, and it's super funny. And I was just wondering if you have like a go-to joke that you tell all the time that always lands, or that you like hearing all the time that makes you feel better. A go-to joke? Yeah. Do I have a go-to joke? I mean, she gave a joke to Goober's mom the other day. But, oh yeah, yeah. And that's not like a, I mean, you could do that one. Okay. Um, what's the worst thing that you could hear? from Woody Nelson after you just had sex from him, <laughs> Willie Nelson. <laughs> I already fucked it up. You see, I, this is my go-to thing, is I do it terribly and it doesn't work and then I cry. I'm gonna do it again. What's the worst thing you could hear from Willie Nelson after you just had sex with him? I don't know, what? I'm not w Willie Nelson. <laughs> yeah. It's better when I'm drunk, I don't know. Started from the bottom, now we're here. Dane. Hey, Aubrey. Um, I was wondering, were there any difficulties uh, being a zombie, and would you do it again if you had the chance? Um, there were many difficulties, um, but I would totally do it again in a heartbeat if the price is right. <laughs> I only do things for money, and uh, that's all I'm interested in. Money. Hello. Um, I just want to say you guys are, like, amazing. Like, I want you guys to go far. I think you're going to win an Oscar one of these days. I'm such a huge fan of yours, and um, Jeff, you've collected such an amazing cast for this movie. Did you get everyone that you wanted for it? And everyone is so, like, comedically trained almost that um, did you allow them for improv or did they follow the script mostly? Yeah, no, I was really lucky. I think it's a, more of a testament to Aubrey than me that, uh, you know, John C. Riley jumped on that fast. And once we had John and Aubrey, it was legitimate. And then we got Dane, which makes it stellar. And then Molly Shannon and Goobler and um, Paul Reiser, like all these people really mean, I mean, not Goobler specifically, but all these people really meant a lot to me growing up. And uh, <laughs> yeah, Goobler, Goobler means a lot to me, but in a different way. But um, 
yeah, like I grew up watching Paul Reiser and My Two Dads, and um, I, there was this movie Odd Jobs that I absolutely loved, and he's so good in Aliens as a villain, which I couldn't even believe how good he is. And John C. Riley, like I don't he, like where do you begin? And <laughs> Molly Shannon literally has one of my favorite start uh, Saturday Night Live sketches with the Jeannie Darcy character, like the slightly autistic like stand-up comedian. So. All those people were definitely people I wanted and I couldn't believe I was able to get away with it. Like it felt for legitimately like I was pulling off a, a heist or a scam. And then like afterwards you're like looking in the mirror and you're like, we got away with it, like let's party. But it was cool, like I, it was amazing. Yeah, I can't believe how lucky I was. Oh, and then improvisation, sorry. And then um, most of the, when we wrote the script for the, when I wrote the script, for the most part, um, I, I'm totally open to people changing lines or m m like, mex like totally doing whatever the hell they want. But with this movie specifically, we didn't have a lot of time. And we didn't, you know, that's like one of the main things you're struggling against is the clock. And some days we were shooting 12 pages. And so it's a lot that you're trying to accomplish in a really short period of time. So as much as we were able to, you know, we'd, and also we didn't, everyone's schedules were crazy. Like Dane pretty much wrapped Spider-Man like a couple days before he came out to LA. And John was doing Guardians of the Galaxy. So everyone was like all over the shop. And so, you know, when we had a chance, we would do rehearsals before we would do takes, but we didn't spend like three weeks in a cabin somewhere just like workshopping it. So it was, you know, every once in a while something would come up. There's a couple of lines here and there. Like in one of the clips, if you see John C. Riley saying like, I'm not a herpetologist, like he made that up himself. And Dane has a joke that's in the movie that we actually, that became a prop. And there's, there was definitely room for improvisation, but unfortunately due to the, the nature of this production, like we had to kind of jam through it. So, and the script was, there's a lot of overlapping dialogue and it's kind of hard to orchestrate it. So. We, I'd say playing 98%, and I'm done with that. All right, I think that's about all we have time for, unless you guys have any parting zombie uh, thoughts that you want to share with everybody. Um, we could talk more about Derrida and smooth jazz. Yeah, that was a big Puppies. hit. Just, you know, tweet as much as you can, everyone. <laughs> Just in general Spell about anything. About Twitter. <laughs> Dan? I, I've just had a really great time, so thanks. <laughs> All right, thanks everybody for joining us. And you can listen Thank to you. this later on iTunes.